Croissoy Blas Nanteos, and to the second of a series of seven talks set in the 1750s in this beautiful Georgian mansion, just a little way out of Aberystwyth on the West Wales coast. And today we're in the very fine morning room at the front of Nanteos, looking out over the Pryce Valley. It's a beautiful evening um, in October, and I'm here with my technical crew, thanks very much to Hannah and to Jeremy, and with the owner of Nanteos himself, who's over from Taiwan, Mr Shane Lipscomb. Uh, it's lovely to have somebody in the audience. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the Powell women. And in order to talk about the Powell women, we have to, at this period in history, talk about the Powell men. So the two Nanteos books to date, The Dipping Pool and The Shadow of Nanteos, uh, deal with two brothers. The older brother, Thomas Powell, who inherited Nanteos back in the 1730s and who started building this wonderful Georgian mansion, Palladian mansion, with his wife's money. And Thomas Powell was an extremely successful man. He was a JP, like his father before him and his grandfather before him, but he also made MP during his lifetime. And he was MP for Cardigan Borough and for Cardigan itself. And Thomas Powell was a very lucky man. He was a nice looking man, according to the portrait, which is in St. Fagans, down in South Wales, the wonderful museum, St. Fagans Museum of Rural Life. And he secured for himself what every self-respecting Welsh gentry man wanted at that time, an English heiress. And the English heiress he managed to get his paws on was a woman called Mary Frederick. Very wealthy woman, huge dowry, and her grandfather had been the mayor of London and also MP for London. And her father too and her brother were all Welsh, very wealthy merchants in London. And so Thomas managed to secure a marriage with Mary Frederick. She was no looker, but he was. And the portrait in St Fagans shows them playing music together. He has his beautiful violin under his arm, very handsome young man, and she, not so handsome, she has too many chins to be fashionable, as she said herself in The Dipping Pool, but she is at the harpsichord. So, for all accounts, um, they had quite a happy marriage. Um, and there are many of their letters written actually by them and to them in the wonderful archive in the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. So researchers and novelists such as myself, we can actually go there and get hold of material that was actually written at the time by the people involved uh, who we're dealing with. So that's a fantastic archive. And though they seem to have a relatively happy marriage, unfortunately it didn't result in any children. So poor Mary Frederick, uh, when her husband died very suddenly of apoplexy, which we now know to be, I would, I would say, a stroke probably, or a heart, heart attack, or maybe um, some sort of um, hemorrhage, something like that. Uh, he died very suddenly in London, actually on the street. And so Mary in 1752, although her money, her dowry, had built Nanteos, she had to leave the house. And it wasn't until 1882 that an Act of Parliament came in, the Married Woman's Property Act, which actually determined a wife to be a legal entity in her own right. Up until that period, and certainly in the 1750s, what we're looking at in uh, both novels here, the woman and the husband were one entity under law. And the woman surrendered her property to her husband at marriage. Although, of course, she would have a dowry that sometimes uh, she would be protected and she would have access to. And some, in some cases, there was a prenuptial arrangement as well, which would protect some property and some wealth for the woman herself. But it wasn't until 1882, which certainly is shocking to me, and I'm sure to many of you will be a shock, that a woman was actually considered to be a separate entity from her husband after marriage. So not only did Mary Frederick change her name, Mary Powell, on her marriage, but of course her money was sunk in these four walls, in the beautiful 
house we now know as Plas Manteos. And the building started, as I said, in 1738 and continued for several decades and actually continued uh, on this same site when her husband had died, when she had to leave her home that she'd uh, built with her own money and she had to go back to live in London, she had to retire. And of course, that's when Elizabeth Powell, who was the wife of the second son, the Reverend William Powell, although there was a, a son in between, John Powell, who died out in South of Africa um, while he was dealing with a family business out there. Um, he unexpectedly, of course, inherited the mansion. And so Elizabeth Powell, who we'll see in a moment, we'll, we'll meet her after we've met Mary, she then takes over at the mansion. So the extract I'd like to read tonight from my newest novel, Nanteos of Ippincourt, is where Mary, as I've imagined her, has to make her final parting with her beloved Nanteos. And when the other brother inherited the house, of course he would inherit everything. He would inherit furniture, he would inherit everything that belonged to Nanteos. Um, and as the heir to his brother's estate, eldest brother's estate, he would take over everything. The, and I've imagined that Mary has been very um, involved with setting out the parkland, with setting out the ornamental trees and the ornamental walk that was to the right-hand side of the house as you look out through these lovely front windows, to setting up the kitchen garden, to setting out the whole sort of visage of the house. Uh, that was very important, the way the house sat in the landscape at that period. And Mary was a very highly educated woman. She had stocks and shares in her own right, and she had also travelled quite widely. And uh, she was certainly aware of continental trends, uh, people, architects such as Palladio, um, who were very important in house design at the time. So in this passage, Mary is making her peace several months after her husband's death and leaving her beloved Nanteos. The carriage is waiting for her, has been there for almost two hours, and her trunk and boxes are all aboard. Other of her personal possessions, including her instrument, will be safely stored and follow when she has prepared her new home to receive them. She looks again through the window. The tiny river pike in front of the house is so innocent. Oh, it doesn't know I'm leaving. She laughs ironically at herself. Always personifying the world, dear Mary. Oh, Thomas had known her well. Goodbye to the long low ridge and the noble trees. A tap at the door. Ellen, her maid. Mistress, she holds up her hand and Ellen's form disappears. A last glance at the ridge. Ah, the sky unrolls its shapely clouds like a moonstone, she says to herself. Yes, Mary, that will do nicely. She opens her door, brushing the beautiful wood with her lips. Ben is out on the landing. She looks once towards Thomas's room as though he could appear, gown open, hair on end, brimful with one scheme or another. There is a murmuring from the hallway, and a line of servants has formed to say farewell to her. Ellen wraps her cloak around her as she reaches the bottom of the stairs. She is leaving her maid here for Elizabeth, and will engage another for herself once she gets to London. Someone a little older. She will travel for the first few miles alone. Then Edward will join her and accompany her some of the way. They have much to discuss and she will be glad of his company. And Edward, as we find out in The Shadow of Nanteos, is her husband Thomas's illegitimate son. Along the line of servants she goes now. Ellen behind her with a pouch of money for each one. This time she faces out through the front door, but she remembers so well coming into the old house, the previous house, for the first time after her marriage. 
There was a purse for each one then too. And looking at them, most of the staff that were here when she was a new bride remains. She is proud of that. The fine of good, kind management over the years that she has kept most of her staff. Last she turns to Martha. She takes the cook's knuckles, which are already curled tightly over the money, in her own hands and squeezes them. About her own age, Martha, though still a mystery to her, has become a confidant in these last months. She turns with her back to the door, says the right thing. Thanks, kind wishes for the future, pledges to visit. Then out into the windy sunshine and up into the carriage. The servants pour through the front door and onto the gravel. Surely the first and last time they will be allowed to do this. And she knocks for the coachman to depart. She waves cheerfully. Now the lake, bald, its banks as yet unplanted. Across the drive, her thin saplings bowing to her from the woodland walks. The newly built lodge and the handsome gates. Then it is over. Tears come. She snorts, gurgles, blows her nose like a herring girl laughing at herself through the tears. Mary Powell of Plas Manteos is no more. So I imagined for her, as for any of us who love our homes, especially those of us who've been lucky enough to build our own homes or to start from scratch, um, how painful that must have been to her and also the realisation that her marriage, which in those days, of course, was defined by having a successful heir to all the property, etc., um, has, in many respects, been a complete failure. So, off she goes. And, of course, she's leaving the house to a younger woman. The younger son's young wife. And it's Elizabeth Powell, who was born Elizabeth Owen, who is the main character in The Shadow of Manteos. And it, it may seem strange that Elizabeth Powell is the heroine of the first novel, and Mary Powell is the heroine of the second novel, yet Mary Powell has the house before Elizabeth. Yet there's an interesting structure between these two books. Um, it's been quite a challenge to write. I've had a lot of fun. But the narrative arc of The Dipping Pool is about twice the length of the narrative arc of The Shadow of Manteos. And so The Dipping Pool, the second book, becomes both prequel and sequel to The Shadow of Manteos, carrying on the story which was left um, so melodramatically, may I say, um, at Manteos at the end of The Shadow of Manteos. So, not as wealthy as Mary. Not as English as Mary, not as well connected as Mary. Elizabeth Owen, nevertheless, is a very interesting figure. She was a clergyman's wife. William, as the younger son, was a clergyman, a very successful clergyman, who was um, at Oxford. And then he was actually made a deacon at uh, Lincoln Cathedral, so I believe. And by the time they inherit Manteos, they've lived in many different places with William. Uh, being a uh, vicar, etc., et around the country. And Mary has three children when she arrives, uh, sorry, Elizabeth has three children when she arrives at Manteos in 1752. So she's a very, very different woman. She comes from near Llanblin Mair, up in North Wales. And although her mother was from a very powerful family, um, her father was from quite a humble, although he was a gentleman, he was from quite a humble property, which we can still see now, a beautiful old farm, I would say going back to late medieval times, called Plas Rhyw Poisson. And her father failed to matriculate from Oxford and was a minor poet. And of course, um, he married in his own way, he married an heiress from the great house in Towin called Ynys Mein Gwyn. So Elizabeth is not of the same stature as Mary. And she would not actually have impressed 
the local women, the local gentry families, in the same way that uh, Mary Frederick had done. However, she has been successful in her own way in producing two children, uh, two of whom were boys. And of course, as I imagined, Mary's grief and trauma and the fact she has to keep her dignity as she leaves the house for the last time as mistress, so I imagine um, Elizabeth's tremendous excitement as she arrives at the house for the first time. If you've been a clergyman's wife and you're the youngest son's wife, you would never have expected to inherit the family pile, particularly not a brand new one, actually still being built. The builders were still here when they moved in. And in fact, there's a pipe, a lead pipe, with her husband's initials as the person who finished the house around the 1750s. So Elizabeth really has landed on her feet. So at the beginning of the book, we see them coming across the brutal um, wastes of the Cambrian mountains on their way to take up their inheritance. And of course, in those days, it was before toll roads, long before toll roads. And in many parts of Ceredigion, Cardiganshire, as, no, as it, it was known then, the roads were so terribly bad that you couldn't actually drive a wheeled vehicle. So for instance, they had to take the ore down from the mines on pack horse. The Hatter women had to take their um, produce to the markets in the east via pack animal. So at the beginning, Elizabeth's coming up from the south of England to take her inheritance, and she's dressed in rough traveling clothes. And we see her from afar. And then gradually, as the chapter progresses, the view, if you like, gets closer and closer and closer. So by this point, we actually see they've arrived at the lodge, which is at the bottom of the beautiful drive of Mount Hall. And at the lodge, this is where the transformation from Elizabeth, Powell, younger brother's wife, to the new mistress of Nantales begins. And as she's changed out of her clothes, stripped down from her travelling clothes by her maid, Ellen, which as you remember probably was Mary's maid, and she transforms into the new mistress of Nantales. And of course, any woman who's ever been bought a wonderful house um, I've just been bought a lovely um, little farm near Hammersbridge, and I remember the way I walked in there, not quite as Elizabeth, but uh, with certainly with glee and anticipation on my face. So here she is, and she's been transformed from the younger brother's wife into the mistress of Mount Nantales. A lady's maid is washing the seated Elizabeth. Her soiled travelling clothes are in a pile by the door, and her shift is pulled open to face, neck, breasts, and under her arms can be carefully sponged. The girl takes her mistress's feet from the warm basin and washes each in turn, scented water trickling between the toes and back into the basin. Then Elizabeth crouches over the water, her petticoats lifted, and washes herself as the maid shakes out her fresh clothes. The towel is new and soft as she pats herself dry. With a great effort of will, she stands still as a tailored dummy as the girl dresses her in a fresh shift, ties on her hooped petticoat and pulls on her stays. As the girl bends to tie the ribbon over her stockings, she lets out a gasp. Elizabeth looks down and laughs as the girl's head appears, red and flustered from under the layers of undergarments. The mark? Elizabeth says, smiling. The maid nods, biting her lip. All as God intended, I assure you. I had it from birth. But the girl stands, frozen to the spot. Don't worry, Ellen, Elizabeth says. I am no witch, I promise you. Still the girl has not moved. Come now, we are keeping people waiting. Tend to your work. Impatiently, she lifts up her own skirts, and Ellen bows down again, holding her face under the clothes. Finally, Elizabeth is laced into her bodice, stockings on, neatly tied with ribbon, and new shoes on her feet. As her hair is being dressed, William comes to stand in the doorway, watches her. She is quivering with excitement as she smiles at her husband from the mirror. 
So um, from that point on with the court, she takes on not only the responsibility of the house, but the joy of being her own mistress. So as I said before, she isn't quite prepared for it. So in terms of the clothes there, at that period, um, an 18th century woman of her standing would not actually have been able to get dressed by herself. I had a wonderful experience um, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. I was trying on some 18th century clothes, and it's late, and the museum was about to close, and I thought, right, okay, I'll get out of these now. And I'd had a, I'd had a passerby lace me into the bodice, um, and I had this big hoop, and then the skirt goes over it. Um, sort of think, think that sort of thing. They were wide on the hips rather than front to back. And I couldn't get out of my clothes. I really genuinely couldn't. And uh, I had to get, uh, when they came to close down the museum and flush us all out, I actually had to get one of the male guards. He was uh, very tickled by it all. I had to get him to unlace me and pull it off. So they actually could not get out of their own clothes. And I think that's an interesting thing to think of in terms of disempowering women. Men could. They, they were more formal dressed um, and they were helped by the man through intercourse, but they could actually physically get out of their clothes, whereas women couldn't. So what I'm wearing now would have been something worn probably on market day by a farmer's wife. So I'm wearing a lot of wool, um, lots of different layers, so people would, be, would have been warm in the winter, I think. I don't think they would have been dry in the rain because obviously wool doesn't keep out rain as, as the sheep attest. They hate rain, but they don't, they don't mind cold weather. Um, and one really interesting thing um, that would have made a difference for women, very often people ask me when I'm doing readings, well, how do they go to the toilet? You know, how, how do they manage, particularly ordinary people, when they're out in the field, that sort of thing. Um, well, it was very easy for a woman at that period because they wore no, no pants. They wore no drawers. So what, what you would do is you would just lean down like that. It would be totally modest. It would be totally private, even if you were out in the field digging mangles or something like that. And you could go to the toilet. You wouldn't soil your clothes, and no one would see you. So actually later, 100 years later, when women did start to wear undergarments, drawers, that sort of thing, obviously then you're going to get a problem because you have to kick, kick them off somewhere or they wrap around your ankles or anybody who's ever gone hiking and been caught short as a female, um, it's a problem. But in those days, it wasn't. So very practical in many ways. Um, and they would have had linen inside, so they would have washed their inside clothes. But things like this, like the apron, like I did today, you just sponge it down. So it's very forgiving, this Welsh wool. Um, okay, so let's move now to the other women on the estate. The, and I'm calling them the Powell women too, because in a way the Powell family, that owned 30,000 acres in this area um, at the height of the, their power, would have owned the people as well. Because if you own where the people lived, and you own their um, homes, and you own the, the factors of production, you own the mills where they worked, you own the um, mines where they work, you own the farms on which they work, and of course you are the JP, you're the justice, you're the sheriff of the peace, you in many ways own, I would argue, the people themselves. So across my two novels there's a huge cast of women characters and I want to sort of look at a couple of them and I'm going to look at the people who were at the bottom first, the most desperate, and of course, uh, the woman possibly who's the most desperate of all, as I've described in my two novels, is called Anne Morgan. And I came across a testimony of her, um, she was a vagrant and she was being punished in a way that was very common at the time for women vagrants. She was stripped to the waist, she was tied behind a cart, and she was basically whipped through the town. And that was at the instigation of a Mr Herbert Lloyd, later a Sir Herbert Lloyd, who features as a baddie in both of my novels. And um, I've described that event in The Shadow of Mount Aos. Um, and it's a true event. If you move then up through the echelons and look at the other people working on the estate in the two novels, you come to people again who were in work subtly, um, perhaps the ore, uh, they were called ore dressers at the time, which rather uh, is a rather fancy word for what the poor women did at that point. 
women and children would have been hitting the ore with hammers, with bandaged hands, in order to get the ore out. They would also have carried the ore themselves on their heads in, in huge baskets or actually on their backs. I've seen engravings and I've seen pictures of the period of women with bare feet carrying ore, like a mule would carry an ore, like donkeys would carry ore. Okay? So those were some of the jobs that women did. Women would also, of course, um, run their own businesses. So, for instance, in the Dipping Pool, the Hatter women are very important. Now, the Hatter women were a real tough bunch. Uh, they're very famous around here from Trevor, and they made, made hats, made out of felt, made out of rabbit fur, hair fur, and, of course, um, wool from sheep. Uh, really stinking cauldrons and stuff. Uh, but they were their own mistresses, some of them, and they would band together and deliver their own wares to the big markets in the East. And these women um, would have worn men's hats, made out of felt, that they would make, make themselves. Well, they weren't men's hats, women wore them as well. And they would carry clubs and short swords in order to um, repel the brigands on the way to the markets in the East. And so they're some great characters. I've enjoyed writing about them. Um, also, a lot of women worked in weaving. This is just the period, about 1750, where weaving is coming out of individual homes, individual farms, and, and big farmers are starting now to clear out their um, sheds, etc., like that, and create proper weaving sheds, and actually started to pay women to um, spe specifically work on weaving. And of course, the main character, apart from Mary in my new book, is... Um, herself a small businesswoman. She helps out in her father's fulling mill, which was owned by the Prices of Gorgerthan, who owned a lot of land to the north of Cardiganshire. And she is called Branwen, and she is really very involved with delivering cloth um, that has been woven to the mill to be pulled. And of course, she wouldn't have been, as the daughter of the miller himself, she wouldn't have been involved in the rather heinous task of stamping the, to clean the, the woven cloth before it was properly um, stamped and hammered uh, in, a, in vats of stale urine. So that was another job that you could do as a woman at the time. I just want to end with um, one fact. We need to think of most women working at this period. And I would actually suggest that even gentry women worked at this period. Because... It was as shame would attest, as any manager of any big country house hotel would attest. It is a lot of work. And it is a lot of work to keep up appearances. And so even gentry women would find that most of their days were tied up in leisure at this period. They were tied up in managing their household and managing people's expectations. But in 1750, even punishments for crime could be gender-based. And until 1790, women convicted of treason or petty treason could be burned at the stake, whereas men were drawn and quartered. It was considered unedifying to open up a woman's body in public. So I think we need to think of that sort of world as everything is different between women and men. And yet women are not the delicate flowers sitting in parlours drinking tea that we like to think of when we perhaps watch Downton Abbey, that sort of thing. They are women who are barefoot, hacking at ore with hammers, or stamping at cloth in vats of stale urine. Okay, I can leave you with a stale urine image, and hope to see you next Thursday, same time, slightly different place. We go into a different room, um, depending on the Wi-Fi, each evening on Thursday night, and... Uh, Next Thursday, it's mud and marble. So we're going to look at different houses in the 1750s from different parts of Cardiganshire. So thanks ever so much. It's just great fascinating to talk to you about my passion. Namaste. Bon entente.